Hello, welcome to episode three of Suffering Beyond Belief. Episodes one and two, I would encourage you to watch those first and then come back to this one. You certainly can watch them out of order, it doesn't really matter. But if you're like me, you like to do stuff in order and you're kind of OCD about that. But anyway, this is episode three, and so I welcome you. Imagine the scene with me. The early morning light is beginning to warm the day. Jesus has had the trial of the century, perhaps of all time. Between Herod, Pilate, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the high priest Caiaphas, and the Romans, it seems that nobody wants to take responsibility for Jesus. Pilate finally decides to consult the masses. He asks the crowd, Jesus called the Christ or Barabbas? Barabbas was a common criminal. They shouted for the release of Barabbas. Pilate says, what then do we do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. Do you hear the crowd? Do you hear the crowd? So Pilate had ordered Jesus to be taken and flogged and then crucified. So the question then is, what exactly is flogging? Scourging would be another term, but those terms are not really well used in the 21st century. And so I'd like to shed a little bit of light, if I can, on what those are or what they mean. Flogging was a punishment that was feared like no other. While extremely brutal, it was common practice for a victim to be flogged before they were crucified. And the Romans had perfected the art of torture through flogging and crucifixion. The instrument here, or that is used, is called a flagrum. I'm going to attempt to draw just a little picture here. The, the executioner would, would have one of these. And the uh, very crude drawing... But anyway, you can look that up. Flay Grum, like this. Just a, a handle, and then these, these leather thongs or, or tails would come. And then at the ends here would be small lead balls, uh, small pieces of bone, uh, dice, even rocks perhaps. Just small little things, uh, sometimes uh, even metal. Sometimes they were they were sharpened to to a point called a scorpion. That's where we get the animal from. But different things like this, and so so this is the the instrument that the Romans would have used in the flogging of Jesus. Now the Romans they didn't have a specific number of lashes that that a victim was supposed to receive. In fact. The executioner, uh, it was up to them. If they felt particularly good, you know, in a good mood, they might go easy and do less. Maybe they were ticked off, and so they were angry and they they did more. Uh, if the victim was going to be crucified and they didn't want the they wanted the crucifixion to last longer, they would do less of a flogging, you know, fewer lashes. So we don't exactly know. The law of Moses uh, said that, that 40 is too many. Like you can't have more than 40. That's, that's too much. And so sometimes a person got to 39 lashes and they were done. If the crime that was committed was severe, the punishment might be more severe as well. So the, the punishment fitting the crime kind of idea here. At this point then, Jesus, he would have been stripped of his clothes and shackled to a column. In, in essence, he'd be, he'd be hugging the column. Whether it be uh, a, a tall column, it might, might have been a short one or a post. He might have been hunched over, kind of around it like this, like his head almost on top of the column. But either way, the, uh, his back would have been, been easily accessible to 
the executioner. Sometimes one or more soldiers would uh, be assigned to, to do the flogging. So the guard would be standing on the side of Jesus. At the command, the soldier then would draw this, the flag room, cross the back with the rotating of his wrist. Uh, his arm would make an arcing motion, dragging the flag room across the back of Jesus. Now the weight of the lead or the bone pieces would fall to the front of the body, uh, ranging all the way from the neck, even all the way down to the, to the back of the legs or the calves even. And as the guard pulls the whip then across the body, the skin, the blood vessels, and the muscles begin to rip and tear. Soldiers uh, could alternate the sides or even the placement of where the lashes are to, to hit the maximum surface area, if you will. Large purple and black bruises would begin to appear. Lacerations and welts would be located almost over the entire body. Ribs were frequently fra fractured. Lungs could even get punctured, making breathing that was already difficult because of the trauma even more so. The intercostal muscles between uh, the ribs, all of the back muscles and the, the neck muscles, all of these muscles would be getting torn and ripped with each blow. Every time the guard would, would rip that flagrum across the body, it would do more damage. The arms, neck, legs would be getting cut open. Sometimes sh uh, shouts of horror and, and, and torment uh, would come from the victim. They might collapse and, and faint, only to be hoisted up and dragged back up into their, into their position around the column so that the flogging could commence. Pneumothorax is the collapse of the lung. This comes from extensive bleeding in the chest cavity. The skin, especially on the, black, on the back, would be hanging just in ribbons, shredded, if it was still attached at all. The muscles in the back uh, would be mashed into an unrecognizable pulp of blood and mush. Uh, in severe cases, the backbone might even be exposed uh, in extreme cases. So every time these lashes, it doesn't say how many lashes Jesus actually received. But even if he received ten, a flagrum might have three tails. That's that's equivalent to thirty. Okay. Fits of vomiting, tremors, seizures, and fainting would occur throughout this whipping process. Jesus was certainly thrust into a state of shock, having been reduced to barely a recognizable person. Remember now, the crown of thorns that we talked about in episode 2, that comes after this flogging. So, Jesus had come from the Garden of Gethsemane, where his blood and sweat were mixed because of his mental anguish. The sleepless night didn't have any food or water at this point since dinner. Okay, now it was daylight. He had to go back and forth from the different places with these crazy trials. He was tired. He was fatigued. His condition was now a serious condition. He was most likely in shock. Hypovolemic shock is now in full swing, which is the, the loss of bodily fluids. Uh, that started again with this hemotridosis in the, in the garden. The pleural effusion, which is the filling of fluid in the lungs, uh, is another cause for shock. This fluid over time mixes with blood and would add pain and difficulty in the breathing. Jesus has been flogged. Sweating drops of blood, being crown crowned with thorns, and now getting flogged like a common criminal. Sorry to say, but the worst is yet to come. Again, a, a side note. Physically speaking, Jesus was suffering a horrible amount, tremendous amount of pain to fulfill this mission that he knew that he had to do. His mental, his, his thinking about all of this stuff would have been, would have been torture, just in, in that sense. So you add the mental and the physical components, and Jesus is 
boy, he's he's going through hell, practically here on earth. In Mark fifteen forty four, it states that Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was so quickly dead. He was on the cross. Uh, by the time frame that, that's been given here, Jesus was on the cross for about six hours. He dies. They, they go to Pilate and say he's dead. And, and But he was surprised at that. Well, given the severity by which Jesus was flogged, I don't know if Pilate should be surprised. As we will discuss in episode 4, the crucifixion was also a horrific instrument of torture. Jesus, Jesus was already weak, in shock, thirsty, and in tremendous pain due to this punishment thus far. Well, that's why I've entitled this series, Suffering Beyond Belief. Thank you for watching episode 3. I hope to see you for the final episode.